I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Namrata Goswami, an independent scholar on international relations, subject matter expert with the Futures Laboratory, co-author of the new book, Scramble for the Skies. She joins us today to discuss the great powers competition for dominance in space and how that applies to near-term scientific and commercial efforts in the lunar environment. So Namrata, welcome back. So today our focus is NASA. They're in the planning stages to develop something called LunaNet, and this is a pretty ambitious plan to build an internet network for the moon that provides connectivity for astronauts and rovers, a lot like cell towers do here on Earth. So I wanted to start out by asking, what makes this so important and exciting? The reason why LunaNet is so important and exciting is because of what we foresee happening in the lunar surface in the next few years, right? So there are several nations with programs to go to the moon. They want to establish uh, not just a settlement, but settlement for a permanent extraction of resources and for ensuring that the moon becomes like the eighth continent of Earth. And so that is why I think the biggest lacuna today is a communication system on the moon, right? So we still depend on Earth. Uh, like a dial-up. Uh, and so what the Luna Net, as per NASA's website, promises is that it's going to build precision navigation timing, so PNT. It's going to help astronauts communicate with each other, for example, on the lunar surface. It's going to ensure where they are in terms of GPS positioning. And most importantly, it's also going to enable a standardized time for the lunar surface, like a lunar time, right? And so all this, what this means is that the importance of it comes because we have the Artemis program that wants to land humans on the moon by 2024, build a permanent structure. You have countries like India and Japan that wants to go to the moon for a longer stay. You have Turkey now announcing a desire to go to the moon and several other nations in Africa and the Middle East. So given that, the critical importance of communication, precision navigation, timing, uh, astronaut rescue, and ability to communicate based on ground stations on Earth, sorry, on the moon, very similar to the kind of internet infrastructure we have on Earth that depends on cell towers and fiber uh, internet. So I think that's what makes it so important and critical. Mm. Well, I did a little bit of research before the interview, and low Earth orbit, as I think everyone knows, is, is already filled with internet satellites, right? I mean, Starlink, they're just going up like crazy. And actually, I just read that China is talking about putting up some kind of a competitor to Starlink. I don't know the details yet, but so, you know, tons of internet going into and out of space. Um, and even the International Space Station apparently has great connectivity. But lunar bandwidth in in today's world is what they they described it as dial up at best which is absolutely terrifying so um you know it, it sounds like it just doesn't cut it for a lot of the things that they want to do and as we start to explore the lunar surface and eventually colonize it it, it probably we just need higher connectivity right Yes, absolutely. And that's the reason why you have uh, NASA. And also what is interesting is that you have companies like Aquarian Space that just receive about, I think, $650,000 in seed funding uh, from Draper. And uh, what they point out is that their development of lunar communication. So the company plans to launch a lunar communication satellite this year. And that's going to be part of NASA's commercial lunar payload service. So you can see that, uh, as what you pointed out so aptly, that given the scale of activity to come on the moon, it is absolutely vital that the moon has its own communication capability and not depend on Earth's support, which lies thousands and thousands of miles away, which require, which means that you the, the ability to collect data, to transfer it, is very limited today right? Mm -hmm. Lost. A lot of it is lost, which might not be the case if we have the kind of lunar net that uh, NASA and the companies are talking about. Okay, so it, it almost sounds like kind of uh, in the hub and spoke model, right? The moon then, instead of being simply a spoke, you know, and right now, like a lot of the satellites and all the probes that are out there, those are all spokes that are out at the end with the Earth as a hub. It sounds like they're talking about turning the moon into the hub 
and then that in turn, you know, the earth would be a much larger hub. So it, that's, maybe I'm not expressing that right, but that's kind of the, the impression that I got, I guess. No, I think you got the right impression. So the idea is that uh, to build, so the interesting thing is that communications PNT is the first step in terms of building a logistic system, right, for the moon. So the moon today is as it is. Uh, we've been to the moon uh, in the 70s. Today we have robotic missions to the moon, but we don't really have a cislunar based space situational awareness. We don't really have the kind of communication capability that Earth has, right, for the moon. And so, yeah, I think what you say is uh, what I see the future. So the moon, instead of being just a spoke, is actually going to become a hub for then to be utilized for uh, missions further out, for example, to Mars or the asteroid belts. And the moon itself will be able to sustain such capabilities given the development of this uh, infrastructure ability. So mm -hmm. uh, you have very aptly put it that way. Well, you know, another thing, and you touched on this earlier, but the European Space Agency recently announced an initiative to get the moon its own time zone and they wanted to do that to help standardize lunar operations and overcome one of these challenges right the challenge is timing and you know if if you know probe a and probe b or rover a and rover b if they don't know what the same time is you know that's that's an issue so i thought it was very interesting do you have any do you have any knowledge on how they plan to do that because time is i mean obviously time itself moves at the same speed but it's not tied to this earth day night cycle right so it seems like it would be very different it will be because the moon has a 14 day earth day right cycle so one moon lunar day so i think it might be tied to that they might create their own standardized could be 24 hour could be less i don't have exact data on that but when i look into the conversations it's about creating a standard that is relevant to the moon and not based on the kind of standards we have for Earth, given the difference in how lunar days and nights unfold, right? And to kind of build an identity of time for the moon that is not connected to this equation we make of 14 Earth days so to make it different. So that's the start. I don't have the technical details of it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I want to remind the audience about Scramble for the Skies. This is the book that you co-wrote with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Gerritsen, who's now retired, and he's actually a professor. So you guys touched on a lot of the, the commercialization of space, humanity's expansion into space, where it's going and why it's going there. And the reason I mentioned the book was you've said the moon is the eighth continent. And so to me, that's a bit like Europeans first landing in the Americas. Do you think that the moon is going to open up the kind of wealth that um, was created as the Americas were colonized? That's a very interesting question, because uh, when you think about the word colonization or colonize, it implies that there is going to be this uh, human life expansion on another planet, right? So by which I mean not just economic activity, but families, reproduction, right? Generation yeah. being developed. So in that particular comparison, what I would think is, as of now, when I hear the kind of space if I may use the word development of the moon, if not colonization, because colonization also has both negative and positive intonations. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 a lot about space development and to utilize the moon for its resources, right? So what I would think of in comparison is, for example, the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia, right, in 1938. So before that, Saudi Arabia was a desert. You had human settlement, but you were not really aware of the kind of economic potential that this particular country had to the world today, right? So in comparison, where, where the moon differs from Saudi Arabia is that the moon could be this amazing bastion of renewable economic activity, right? So for example, uh, as I see the plan unfolding, and we discussed this in Scramble for the Skies, 
You will have first the uh, recognition and the development of the scientific capability to look at lunar resources like iron ore, aluminum, which could be used to build, uh, for example, space-based solar power satellites that could then be used to generate renewable energy, right? So the moon has enormous potential. And I would say that it would lead to the development of space that would increase the economic return, as well as the ultimate desire of humans to one day settle there or build the moon as a hub to then go forward to other planets, right? And so mm -hmm. that's how I see the trajectory happening. Um, there is similarity with the way America was colonized because the one similarity I would see is that like America, where if you remember when there was the westward expansion, it was a lot about the gold, right? Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm, I have read, I went to the Oregon, I saw the Oregon Trail, I went to the museum, <laughs> and what I understood was that goal might have been the vision, but the entire industry that was built around getting people to a place, right, for example, the wagons, the food that had to be supplied, the communication that had to be maintained, that itself built an amazing industry, right, and many people actually did not end with the goal. And so I see the moon very similarly, that it has lots of potential and it, it will be first economic, the logistics will be built, and then finally there'll be extraction of resources and to scale it up. Yeah, well, and in this case, gold, platinum, and every other precious metal that you could imagine are available in large quantities in the asteroids, right? And yes. it would make sense to use the moon as a staging area to access those. I mean, I, I think that the, the biggest advantage is the lower gravity, right? With 1.6G, it just takes less fuel to get there, less fuel to get off, but you still have a somewhat Earth-like environment. So, you know, if you have like storage containers, you can set them on the ground and not have to worry about them floating off, you know. Um, you can use, I mean, mining equipment and vehicles, you know. So it seems like it it has some of the advantages of an Earth-like environment, but without that that massive gravity well that you have to go into and get out of all the time. I mean, do you think that that'll make it kind of, uh, do you see the moon becoming kind of the ultimate staging area for a lot of these future missions elsewhere? Yes, because if you, I mean, if you think about uh, the Chinese argument as to why they are developing the moon, right? For example, a pro I know we'll talk about this later, but just quickly, the argument is that if you launch from the moon, it's 22 times more efficient, you, you need less energy. And so I was just thinking about the calculation of this. So if you think about, if you have to escape Earth's gravity, you need about uh, 25 times the speed of sound to actually escape Earth's gravity, which means a lot of fuel, right? If you want to escape Earth's gravity pull, now, okay, you've gone, you've reached orbit, and then you have to escape Earth's gravity to go to another planet. You need 32 times the speed of sound to actually escape. Again, that's a huge amount of resource, right? The moon, in comparison, you need only th three times the speed of sound to leave the lunar surface to get to lunar orbit. And to leave lunar orbit, you need seven times the speed of sound, just to make it a, a very simple uh, comparison, right? So 25 times to leave Earth's orbit to get to lunar, uh, Earth's, uh, to leave Earth's surface to get to Earth's orbit, 32 times the speed of sound to leave Earth's gravity pull to go to another planet and look at the moon, just three times the speed of sound to leave its surface to get to lunar orbit and seven times the speed of sound to escape it, right? So yes, your point that the moon offers uh, a lot of the advantages like Earth's like environment, but it also has this amazing uh, feature that can be used to the advantage of humanity if it wants to move out to other planets in the system. Yeah, well, you know, some of the other things, again, from I did a little bit of research before this, um, lunar regolith contains oxygen and hydrogen, which can be used to generate life support, obviously, as well as chemical fuel. Uh, there's trapped solar helium-3 that gets into the micropores of the regolith. That can potentially be used for future fusion reactors. And then there's believed to be frozen water in the craters at the poles. And so it seems like, you know, in addition to this role as a staging area, there are also a lot of benefits in terms of obviously being able to produce breathable oxygen, um, being able to produce fuel for things, 
um, water, not only for life support, but uh, from reading about nuclear propulsion, I understand that at least some of those systems uh, use things like steam, right? Where it may be nuclear in nature, but they're superheating steam. And so you would still need water as a fuel. So it, it seems like it actually has materials. And then I think you'd mentioned uh, aluminum and other metals as well, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you look at some of the rationale for the Indian lunar program or the Japanese program, China's program, it's all about realizing that moon has a huge uh, resource, which is helium-3, right? And because of helium-3 being such a critical fuel for nuclear fusion, there is this scramble, right? That who gets there first, who's able to extract that. So helium-3 is one very vital resource for a technology that is yet to come, but will come one day, which is nuclear fusion and nuclear propelled spacecraft, which makes that particular point you uh, made very aptly earlier, that it's not just the gravity, less gravity, it's not just the fact that we need less energy to leave the lunar surface, but also because the moon is so rich in resources, right? It has helium-3, aluminum, iron ore, silicon, platinum that can be used to build structures like for example you can even build a rocket if you have a base on the moon right and so yes and uh, that's actually extremely vital and in fact uh, uh, jet propulsion laboratory and nasa has done estimates and including the china national space administration and the indian space research organization that the moon should be seen as uh, especially from the indian and chinese perspective the moon should be seen as a place where we build it as a hub for all the humanity's inspirational desire to then reach out to the system. So it's not, and it's fascinating, Tim. So the conversation is very strategic. It's not just inspiration, exploration, science, right? It's about ensuring that we can use our moon for to our advantage to actually one day be able to uh, settle elsewhere. And so the moon provides those resources, as you were mentioning. Yeah. Well, you know, I should touch a little bit on the Artemis Accords. Again, you'd mentioned this earlier. So that's a non-binding multilateral agreement by the countries that are participating in it, which really just kind of involves NASA, the ESA, and the Japanese space agency, JAXA. So Artemis is our project. I think you'd mentioned 2024. That's the the goal to put, uh, I, I believe they were saying, the first woman and the next man back on the moon, if, if I phrased it correctly. Um, that's on the Western side of things. But I understand that Russia and China are also collaborating on their own projects that are outside of that framework, right? Um, are, are these efforts from these uh, rival great powers, is that cause for concern or uh, will they just pursue this independently, do you think? So, yeah. So, as you said, the Artemis uh, program is a bilateral arrangement between different countries. If I remember the data right, about 28 nations have signed on to it. So, which means that it's uh, the European Space Agency, JAXA, but also uh, the individual space agencies of those nations, right? And recently, two African nations uh, signed on mm, okay. the Artemis Accord, which means that the scale of it is expanding. So if you look at the Artemis Accord itself, of course, the conversation we had earlier gets vindicated because now you have a major and actually the leading space power in the world, the United States, supporting a lunar development program that includes LunaNet, infrastructure development, a base on the moon, sending humans back, this time for a permanent settlement conceptualization, as well as if you look at the preamble itself, it talks about space resource utilization, right? And so uh, what is now, why, where the concern comes, right? So we have this democratic-led Artemis program, but as you said, we also have China and Russia that have signed a memorandum of understanding in 2021 to develop a very similar permanent space research station on the moon, right, by 2036. Now, where the concern comes is that if China or Russia in or in combination establishes a research base, and they are very clear in their timelines, China is very, very aggressive about meeting the timeline, what happens if they have a base which they are scaling out and creating the infrastructure for on the south pole of the moon, 
and they actually take over one of the most advantageous areas where you have, as you said, water ice, where you have permanent sunlight, and then says that once the permanent structure is established, no other nation can come there because that would interfere with their activity or they might create a zone of non-interference like they have mm -hmm. done in some places on earth. And I've said this before in your program. Now that's where the concern comes, right? So how do we ensure that the Artemis program led by the US and others have access as well? If you're not there first, there is always that li likelihood that another nation might dictate the term. So that's where the strategic concern comes yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in, in taking things back to LunaNet, one of my hopes would be that uh, the networking standards that we have here on Earth, right, which seem to be very universal. I mean, someone in China, you know, if it's approved by the firewall, they can visit the same websites that someone in Russia can, someone in the United States can, you know, um, we can do email all over the world, you know, so uh, the, the internet has come a long way in terms of standardization. And my hope would be that, you know, in the lunar environment that we could see the same thing so that, you know, it, whether or not they're particular participating in the Artemis Accords, I would hope that they would be able to use these uh, common standards of this, this, you know, this planned communications network and be able to communicate, right? And it, it seems like that would be beneficial, even if there is great powers rivalry. Yeah, that, that could be the case, right? As you said, with the internet and with uh, GPS, for example, before China had its own Beidou navigation system, China also depended on the GPS, right? So it is it is absolutely likely that once you have a global scaling infrastructure like LunaNet develop in support of the United States and very similar to how the internet unfolded with ARPANET, right? And so it could it is very likely that once a developed uh, LunaNet is in place, another country, for example, like China might use it in case they need it very, uh, you know, they need it for their own um, uh, development. But I think what is interesting and what is the pattern here is a little different, right? So if you look at how space development has happened in the last few years, China has shown the strategic urgency, I would use the word urgency, to develop their own systems, right? So they are now, they have, their internet is very much monitored. So there is a huge monitoring of what people can receive. I could not access some of my websites or email when I was in China, right? And so uh, that's there. And then the second point is that if you look at their entire scaling up of an alternative to the GPS, right? They have their Beidou navigation system. They have their own fiber uh, undersea cables. They are the leaders in that for their internet development. Now they're even talking about their own satellite constellation. They don't want yeah. to have any kind of Starlink uh, enable satellite internet constellation in China. They want their own. There are reasons for that because they have, they're a closed system. They have a particular strategic purpose why they are doing a particular activity. And I think a similar kind of mindset uh, would develop for the moon, right? So I'm sure China is watching this particular Luna net development. The fact that you have Nokia now collaborating with NASA to try to attempt to build a 4G kind of communication system on the moon, right? Or standardized time. So they would obviously study and would want to establish their own system as well, given the closeness and the desire to have an alternative to the Western-led uh, lunar infrastructure. So I, I predict that's going to happen. It might not, but uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Well, Namrata, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. And let me close by asking, uh, what do you think that we can expect to see next in terms of lunar exploration and this infrastructure that we're already seeing in the planning stages start to really grow out in, I guess, a more real way? Sure. So I think that it'll follow three very clear stages when you look at lunar development in terms of infrastructure. One is what we are seeing now, the development of PNT communications, time, a time zone uh, for the uh, easiness of doing business activity on the moon. 
not just astronauts going there, but the fact that you want to scale it up. That, that I expect in the next five years to come to some level of maturity, right? And so by 2029, 2030, between that period to 2035, what I expect to see is the development of the larger industrial scale activity. So what I expect is that once you have communications and that infrastructure in place, you might have then robot mining capability, uh, a company like, for example, Offworld will want to develop such capability, right? So how do you actually scale up your robotic extraction, mining, development capability? That will probably be the next five years. And then from 2035 onward, what you will see is the actual extraction and development of lunar resources to build the hub that we have been talking about today. So that would that future will come after 2035 in my assessment. So that's what I expect to see in terms of the moon. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim, for having me as always.